All right, one second. Okutvach. Wow, Rabzev, Kutvach. So, Kutvach. Kutvach, Kutvach. So, tonight is actually very special. Even though the 12th of Sivan is when the last opportunity to bring the sacrifices for the holiday of Shavuos. And so it seems like the end of the whole holiday season was on Shabbos. But then we spoke out about the power of after Shabbos, about the 13th of Sivan. And he said that it's actually when all these special days are finished, that you can tell whether or not you made a connection with Hashem in the Torah. But it's precisely when you study Torah tonight and connect with Hashem tonight, then you can tell that uh, the Shuas reached you. As the famous uh, expression, how do you know who the groom is by the wedding? The, the bride, you can tell the bride is, she wears a dress. How do you tell the groom is, you tell the groom is by, 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 the groom is the one who takes the bride home at the end of the evening. So how do you know who married the Torah? The ones who are here tonight studying Torah and starting off right with the week with, uh, with the Chesir Shemaisa, with, with his story, Tzadikim. I have for you tonight um, two stories, the story of the Baal Shem Tev and the story of our Rebbe. Um, the story of the Baal Shem Tev, uh, is, is, is told in many different ways, the story that we're going to share, but I found a uh, pretty reliable source for it, Rabbi Shail Brook, who was one of the venerable uh, Hasidim of the previous generation, who he shared the story himself, and it's printed in Sephori Hasidim. Uh, it was actually Saturday night, and the Baal Shem Tev was went on a journey together with three of his top Hasidim, Rav David Mikolaev, Rav David Sirkis, and Rav David Laikas. He went together with the, the wagon driver of the Baal Shem Tev, Alexei. And as, not to be confused with, um, with Alexa. Okay, anyways, sorry for that humor. So they went together, and, and the Baal Shem Tev, as often, he would, he would tell Alexei to turn the other way, away from the horses, but the horses would go by themselves. And in a moment, they had kvitsa saderech, which means they were able to cover huge distances instantaneously. On the Monday after this journey began, on Saturday night, the Monday after this journey began, they went off the road, got stuck in a forest, and they couldn't, it was so, it was so dark because of the forest, they couldn't, they could barely see any light at all. They didn't know where they were. And Baal Shem Tev, they could tell, was feeling very bad. And he, not only did he feel bad, but the language that Rabbi Brook said was, Baal Shem Tev, he lost his vision, he lost his insight. And he was like a regular person. Baal Shem Tev was, did not have that insight that Baal Shem Tev usually had the divine inspiration. He was like a regular person. And this continued on from Monday, when he got lost in the forest, this continued on from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, until Friday afternoon. And when Baal Shem Tev saw that they hadn't yet arrived to a village, it was already Friday afternoon, Baal Shem Tev was in great pain. And he fell asleep because of his pain. And well, his students thought, surely his, Hashem will reveal to him in his dream what's going on. But he woke up from his sleep and nothing was shown to him. And this, his pain and his three students' pain was even greater. And they were in terrible agony. At midday, they saw from a distance a light. And they traveled. They were very happy. Ah, for surely Hashem has brought us to a village at least we have a place to rest for Shabbos. And they traveled in the direction of where the light was coming from. And they arrived at a small home in the middle of the forest. They come to the door, and one who answered the door was a very coarse individual. He came to the door barefoot, and they asked, can we please stay with you? He said, I don't want you. He said, I don't want you. I don't want your Shabbos. You, you are, I could tell from the way you're dressed, you guys are Hasidim. I hate people like you. My father, my grandfather was disgusted by people like you. Get away from me. I don't even want to look, I don't even want to look at your faces. 
So the students of Baal Shem have asked, is there any other place we can go nearby? And he told them that the same distance that from where you traveled from, you have to go all the way back that distance in order to find anywhere else. There's, there's, no, there's nowhere nearby. So they asked and they begged them, could we please stay with you? They offered him a lot of money and the guy agreed, but he made a couple of conditions. Condition number one is, you cannot daven out loud because the non-Jews come to buy vodka and they're going to get scared, they're going to get annoyed by your davening. You can't daven out loud. Condition number two, you can't daven for a long time because I'm very hungry, you said. I need to eat in the morning and I need to eat early in the evening. And number three, you cannot do the foolish thing that Hasidim do, he said, and check over and over again how kosher I am. I'm going to serve you. And you're going to eat. And that's all. They come into the home and after they rested a little bit, the Baal Shem Tev asked him if there's a, is there a river nearby where we could immerse ourselves before Shabbos, the mikvah. When the guy heard, they start to curse them and scream at them. And he said, now I know your guys are thieves. And when, he's, he's about to throw out all their luggage and all their belongings before Shabbos. And only after great effort, they managed to calm him down that he shouldn't kick them out. In their the house, there was no table, there were no chairs, there were no benches. There was like this board on top of these four pegs. And the, the, the rooms were also like empty, barren rooms. There were no people there. There were no, the guy said that there were non-Jews buying vodka. There was no one there at all. There were no animals there. There are no birds, there are no uh, cats, nothing. And so they, the, the, the Baal Shanda students felt frightened from the loneliness and the, 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 the like utter like bareness of where they were. And meanwhile, they saw that the sun's going down, it's almost Shabbos, and the guy is not doing anything to prepare for Shabbos. He's going from one end of the room to the other, he's eating a watermelon, and he's just whistling. And so night is about to arrive, the guy takes a, uh, a, a, a piece of, of leather, a black piece of leather, he spreads it over the table. He takes a, a, a candle, he sticks it into some, some, some mud on the table, and he lights one candle. And they didn't see him daven mincha. And uh, he started davening Shabbos, Kabbalah Shabbos very quickly, swallowing words. And, they, um, and he finished davening in, in a few minutes, very quickly. So they also had to quickly finish their davening. They fin as a condition that they made, they finished their davening and they told him good Shabbos. And his response was, may you have a terrible year. Okay. They wanted to sing Shalom Aleichem, start screaming at them and cursing them. They had to be quiet. So the guy took a cup of vodka to make Kiddush and he told me, you have to have in mind to be Yoitza, to fulfill your obligation with my Kiddush. They begged him, could we please make our own Kiddush? We'll pay you after Shabbos. You don't want to hear anything about it. No, all of you, Baal Shem Tev, and you all have to fulfill your obligation with my Kiddush. He said Kiddush, skipping words, making mistakes in words. And when he finished Kiddush, he drank almost the whole entire cup, only a few drops left. And he put on a thick black piece of bread on the table, one piece of bread. And uh, they asked him, we have Lecha Mishnah, two pieces of bread for Shabbos. So he started, he started to, in the language of Rabbi Brook, he almost swallowed them alive because of their question. He didn't let them touch the bread either. He said, I'm going to serve you. Is your hands are too disgusting to touch my bread. And so he cut them all hamaytzi, all pieces of bread, and they each person a piece of bread. And then he brought to the table a bowl of lentil soup. He gave everyone, he gave everyone a spoon. We're all going to eat this from the same bowl together. He didn't, let, he didn't let them sing, Zmira, sing, sing the song of Shabbos. He didn't even let them do a mezumen. He said to them in Yiddish, the word mezumen is also a word for like, mezumen means, mezumen is a, is a language we use for the blessing that we do for, for three people for the after for after a meal. Mezumen also means cash. So he said, I don't believe in mezumen. No, mezumen, all I, mezumen I believe is in cash. Anyways, he drove them crazy the whole entire Shabbos and they couldn't even tell it, is it Shabbos or is it not Shabbos? Next day, before it's even daybreak, the guy is already finished davening. He's walking around without shoes, davening quickly. 
and they had to get up quickly and dive them too, and they had to quite finish diving fast. And he drove them. He, he drove them even more crazy than the day before. After mincha, they wanted to have suda shlishis. He didn't let them have it. He said, "You guys are are gluttons. How, you just ate lunch. You're eating again. You gluttons." And the the only thing they could do for the third meal, as customary by some anyways, is to say words of Torah, um, because it says in the Torah that uh, when Hashem gave us the man, um, it says Hashem told us, "Don't look for the man on Shabbos, because today you will not find it in the field." So the, the Gemara says it says the Torah uses the word today three times. And the third time it says, today you won't find it in the field. So Rizal says, so the third meal of Shabbos is anyway supposed to be a spiritual meal. You don't have to um, eat the third meal. Anyways, the, the, each of these three students of the Baal Shem Tov were tzaddikim in their own right. And the Baal Shem Tov were all wondering, what is God doing to us? And the Baal Shem Tov himself, all of his insight, all of his, he, he didn't know. He lost everything. Came Saturday night. Again, he yelled at them. Again, he cursed them. And then they went to try to sleep a little bit. They wanted to dive in early, and they dive in early wanted to travel. But the guy closed the door and he said, No, I made a meal for you. <laughs> we'll pay you for our meal. Let's just go. Did you call me a thief? I made a meal for you. I have to eat my, eat my meal. And he kept them until the, and to, and I'm not done preparing for the meal. <laughs> Drove them crazy. And he made them stay until nighttime. At night, they were scared to travel, so they had to stay. So the same thing happened on Monday, and the same thing happened on Tuesday until Wednesday. So that comes Wednesday, the guy takes all of their belongings because of the, the food that they gave him, uh, for the food that he gave them, and he said, okay, now you guys can go. They left the guy, and they're ready to go on their journey, and all of a sudden, a door opens in the home door, which wasn't open before, and a woman who could tell, you could tell someone was very uh, wealthy, and dressed like a, a, a wealthy woman. And she comes out and she comes over to, over to Baal Shem Tev, And he's asked Baal Shem Tev, says, Rebbe, please stay with us for Shabbos. It was Wednesday. Baal Shem, Tev is <coughs> Baal Shem Tev is shocked. He says, I have two questions for you. Question number one, how do you know that I'm a rabbi? And question number two, if you didn't know I'm a, I'm a rabbi, how come you allowed our Shabbos to be ruined? Why didn't you come earlier? So she answered, Rebbe, you don't recognize me? Baal looked at her and he didn't recognize her. So she told him the following. She said, I once worked in your home and I was an orphan, not a father and mother. And I had this lice in my head, my hair. And your Rebbetson, your wife, would comb my hair to get out of the lice. And it was every Friday, she would comb my hair to get out the lice. And I, one Friday afternoon, I screamed. I did not let her comb my hair. So the Rebbitson gave me a light slap on my cheek. And you stood there, and you didn't say any protest. So in the heavenly courts, this caused a great uproar. How come you didn't, up, you, how come you didn't protest? She was an orphan, and you let an orphan have pain. So the, the, the heavenly court decreed that because of this, you will lose your share you, the Baal Shem Tov, lose your share in the world to come. So I married a tzaddik, a hidden tzaddik, and that's who was your host of Shabbos. And we saw together what was the creed in the heavenly court, and we asked Hashem to forgive you. We died Hashem should forgive you. And we achieved through our prayers the following. The heavenly court agreed to the following. Since it says in the Torah, that Shabbos is a taste of the world to come. So if one Shabbos of the Baal Shem Tev will be ruined, you won't be able to experience the joy of Shabbos, that will be equivalent to the world to his losing his share in the world to come. But that, so that's what the Heavenly Court agreed, but the problem was there was no one who was willing to implement the decree of the Heavenly Court and to ruin the Baal Shem Tev, the Shabbos, who would do that? So we agreed to do, do this ourselves, and now that your Shabbos was ruined in the place of the world to come, now you will have a share in the world to come. At that moment, Baal Shem Tov's Ruach HaKodesh, his divine inspiration returned. He saw all the words the woman said were true. And he stayed with his students there for the next Shabbos. And they had a wonderful, joyous Shabbos there. And they shared secrets of the Torah there. And they traveled after the next Shabbos. 
That was the first story I wanted to share. Second story I want to share is a story I heard from Abishol Weiss. Nine Gazunt. So Weiss, um, he shared a story about his father, 1988 or 89. His father was diagnosed with colon cancer. And that year, that time, having significant colon cancer was like a death sentence. Didn't have the uh, kind of, of uh, treatment that they have today. And the doctors, it was a Sunday morning. They told him they want to make an operation on him on Tuesday, Tuesday morning. And after the operation, he's going to have to remove a large part of his colon. And after the operation, he won't be able to go to the bathroom as before. And for three weeks, he's going to be in the hospital. So his father was very upset. He didn't want the operation. And he was so broken, we saw Asabe Brisky, the Rebbe's emissary in Nagura, what should he do? So Brisky said, you should call the Rebbe. So he called the Rebbe's office. Rebbe Groner answered. This was at one o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday. And Rabbi Goner said he's going to go into the Rebbe's room at four o'clock. So he should call back four or five o'clock to see if there's an answer from the Rebbe. So meanwhile, he should send a fax of all the details of his father's condition. Then the details, he sent the fax to Rabbi Groner, to the Rebbe, and Rabbi Groner went into the Rebbe's room and, he, and, he, and when, he, when he saw called again, he told him that the Rebbe said the following. The Rebbe said that you should check your father's film. Okay. So he goes home, tells his father and mother what the Rebbe had said, and he discovered that his father doesn't have any film. So he calls up Rabbi Groner, and Rabbi Groner said, listen, if your father doesn't have film, and the Rebbe says, you should check the film, what do you think we should do? And Rabbi Groner said, I will get film right away. So it was already six o'clock in LA, and the only store available at that time to buy film in Los Angeles was a Michelin store on Fairfax. And that was closed already at six o'clock. So uh, they couldn't get filmed that night. But Rabbi Groner said he should have film before the surgery. So Rabbi Sapachinsky, he traveled the next day from Agura to LA and got a pair of film. And uh, Baruch Hashem, he put on film, he has a pair of film. And came Tuesday morning, and it was time for the operation. So the operation, the doctor comes out after two hours of operating. Doctor says, is a total miracle happened over here. We thought we have to remove the majority of the, col the colon. We only need, the cancer is a lot smaller than we thought it was. We only have to remove about an inch of the colon. And the, his father was freed from the hospital the very next day. This is in sync with what we're reading about in the, uh, this season of uh, giving the Torah. Hashem tells us, if you go on my mitzvahs, I will give you all the blessings. He just made a decision to on film and uh, to wear kosher film. And miraculously, the whole illness he had in his colon, they diagnosed with x-rays and everything, just totally was removed. And he's able to go home the next day. Anyways, those stories I want to share.